गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज जेलमैन मुझे यानी थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग दिस मॉर्निंग आई सी दैट यू डिसाइड टू टर्न ऑन द वाटर दिस मॉर्निंग इन रकेराकी दिस इज़ द लास्ट सेट ऑफ कंसल्टेशन वी हैविंग फॉर द बजट राइज़ द लास्ट प्लेस वी चोज़न अनफॉर्चुनेटली वी कैन नॉट बी इन प्लेसेस लाइक ताबुआ � But we've covered most of the the other parts in Fiji. We also were uh, in parts of Banua Levu, uh, places like Tawake and Loa. So I, I won't uh, take very long. Um, what we normally do with these consultations, we uh, give a short presentation to you on where the economy is, how things are moving, what are the things we need to consider, and uh, and then we open up the floor so people have any suggestions any comments any submissions they like to make uh, they can do so if you have any personal problems you got a lot of staff there at the back uh, they can take down your details what the problem is your phone contact details and then we can get in touch with you the session here is obviously about the budget itself and at the end of it you can ask any questions like i said if you um, want to speak in any language you can we've got people here who can translate so what has happened in the economy is obviously covid is a major issue as a result of covid our budget our sorry our gdp became much smaller we lost about uh, 4.6 billion dollars in other words the size of the economy became smaller much smaller because obviously the borders shut down the tourists stop coming to Fiji. Tourism contributes about 40% towards our economy. And you know, when tourists come to Fiji, it's not only about the tourists who stay at the hotel. It's about everybody else that lives of the people who live of the tourism sector. So I'll give you an example. If you go to Nandi Airport, outside the airport, there are ladies there who sell roti parcel, lovo packs, boiled ivy, mitai, all those things. Their customers are not the tourists. Their customers are the people who work at the hotel. Their customers are the people who work at Fiji Airways. Their customers are the people who work at ATS. So when the, ho uh, when the airport is shut down, when Fiji Airways is not flying, when ATS people aren't working, these people also lose their customers. So it has a big spin-off you know, impact. Fiji, of course, like other countries also, the economy um, in many other countries, tourism-based countries like Maldives, St. Lucia, the economy is also contracted. That's Fiji here. We lost $4 billion in foreign reserves. What is foreign reserves? Foreign reserves is basically foreign currency. All of you are wearing clothes. All the clothes you are wearing comes from overseas. That bula shirt may be sewn in Fiji, but the fabric comes from overseas. Mainly, most of the shoes you're wearing comes from overseas. This mic I'm holding comes from overseas. These chairs, this steel comes from overseas. All the cars around comes from overseas. The fuel in the cars comes from overseas. This laptop he's got comes from overseas. The potatoes you eat, the onions you eat, the garlic you eat comes from overseas. So when you buy things from overseas, you need foreign currency. They don't buy it in Fijian dollars. You have to pay Japanese yen, US dollars. Euros, Aussie dollars, New Zealand dollars. So when tourists come to Fiji, they bring that money to Fiji. We get foreign currency. When Fiji Airways sells tickets in Los Angeles, we get foreign currency. Japanese yen, when they sell tickets in Japan, we get foreign currency. As a result of the border shutting down, we lost about four point, we lost four billion dollars in, uh, in foreign currency. Government revenue went down by half. Overnight, when the border shut down, government lost 50% of whatever it used to earn. Why? Because the tourists are no longer coming. Over 100,000 people lost their jobs. They're not paying any taxes. A lot of people buying less things, so your government lost revenue by 50%. Over 100,000 Fijians lost their jobs. Directly, and a lot of them indirectly also. So the supermarkets that used to supply bulk food to the tourism sector no longer can do that because there's no tourists coming in they don't need that food so the people who used to work in the supermarkets they say sorry go home 
People at the hotels used to work, sorry, go home. So a lot of people lost jobs. So the economy shrunk quite uh, tremendously. So what did we do? And I'll tell you what, what has actually happened. We obviously spent about $500 million in what we call income support. A lot of you here would have got 360. A lot of you here would have got the two rounds of $50, would have received the $90. The people who are selling um, uh, the vegetables at the market, they don't pay market fees. We pay the market fees for them on their behalf to the municipal council. Now with private doctors, you can go and see private doctors and we pay for that also. You don't have to pay for it. I think there's one in Ra, right? We got one. No, there's none in Ra. So there's no private doctor in Ra. None of the private doctors in Ra wanted to participate. You go and talk to them. But in Ba and Tavua, Nandi, Latoka, Singatoka, Navua, Suva. Sorry? Okay, so there's one opening by September, who we've actually approved. And uh, in Suva, Nakasi, Nandera, Nosori, one in Savasavu, Lambasa, all those doctors, once they start over here, you can then, when you go and see the doctor, you can do the blood test, you can do the sugar test, urine test, cholesterol test, fluid blood, full blood count test, kidney function, liver function, if you're asthmatic, then uh, nebulizer. All of that will be paid for by government, even if you go to a private go a doctor, the injections, etc. So that's part of some of the things that we have done. Now, the economy obviously was growing for nine years straight. We've never had nine years of straight growth uh, in the economy in Fijian history ever. We had once after independence, seven years of straight growth. But we did not have se nine years of straight growth. Of course, as a result of the pandemic, the economy shrunk by 17.2%. It shrunk again last year by 4.1%. We expect the economy to grow by 12.4% this year because the borders have opened up. Borders have opened up, the tourists have started coming, a lot of people have got back their jobs, etc. Now, the reason why it's growing by 12.4% is because we're starting off with a lower base. And the only reason why we were able to open up the borders, on uh, only reason why we were able to open the borders on 1st of December last year is because over 90% of the population got vaccinated, the adult population. You may remember last year in March, there were something like five or 6,000 cases, COVID cases. However, government put in place a lot of initiatives to make sure we got vaccinated at a very quick rate. So we had a no job, no jab policy. If you wanted to work, you had to be vaccinated. If you want the 360, you have to be vaccinated. And you can see, if you look at the rate of vaccination, it is fairly steady. When we said you had to, get, you had to be vaccinated to, to get the 360, we saw it all spike. No jab, no job policy, we saw it spike. So a lot of people obviously went and got vaccinated because, because they were incentivized by money. Or jobs, for that matter. But a lot of people for 360 went and got themselves vaccinated. Now, as a result of those policies, Fiji became one of the most highly vaccinated countries in such a short period of time in the developing world. You remember in March, April, all the media and everybody else were crying, saying, oh, four or five thousand cases. And now, within six months to seven months, we were, we were the most uh, vaccina highly rated vaccinated countries in the world. That's why we're able to open up the borders. As a result of opening up the borders, the economy is coming back to life. Fiji Airways has started flying. Our planes are running full. Last night, Fiji Airways announced they now will be having direct flights to Canada, to Vancouver. We have a lot of Fijians who live there in Vancouver. We also have a potential to get more tourists from there too. Because we need to think outside the box. We need to have different sources of tourists, different markets, what they say. So if you look at the tourism arrivals, you see in 2019, it was about 894,000 tourists we got. Jeez, unfortunately, you can't see it all from there. It's 894,000. 2020 went down to 147,000. Last year went down to 37,000. 
Imagine that. So, okay, great. So I don't have to yell. So, we expect about 490 odd thousand tourists this year. Where are they mainly coming from? They're mainly Australians. In the month of May, if you compare the month of May, this month of May, 2022, and you compare the month of May 2019, we've got 90% of them have come back. The 90% of the numbers we had. New Zealand is the next one. We're getting about two thirds. New Zealand, as you know, until recently, their borders were closed. Their borders were closed. They've now just opened up, so New Zealanders don't have to go into quarantine. The June and July bookings are looking uh, a lot better than what uh, we thought they would be. Now, I'm sure you all agree that the price of things are going up. Inflation. Why do we have inflation in such a short period of time? Now, before the Russia-Ukraine war, when the borders opened up, and we had the, uh, before the borders opened up, because of, a, because of the pandemic, a lot of things, the prices increased. There are two, th two things, or two reasons why the price of things increased. You see this, this, this phone over here, this phone operates with a microchip. Computers are microchips, phones are microchips. The microchip is made out of a particular metal that you get from the ground, you know, like digging for minerals. It's made out of a particular metal. Now, when the borders were shut down, all, most countries in the world were shut down. In fact, all of them were shut down. They had bubbles, they had lockdowns. So a lot of these things weren't being mined. They weren't available. But people still want mobile phones. People still want to upgrade. So, less mi minerals available to make the microchip. Shortage of, my, uh, of uh, microchips available in the world. There's been articles recently written on it, but high demand. When you have a high demand, less supply, the price of things will go up. Yangona before Cyclone Winston was $85 a kilo in Suva. After Cyclone Winston, $185 a kilo. Bananas were $3 a bunch in Suva. After Winston, because all the banana trees fell down, $7, $8. Long beans in the market here, $2 for long beans. After the Cyclone, $5, $7. Right? Because of what you call supply demand issues. The other uh, impact of the pandemic was the cost of freight, containers went up in price. A container from uh, f uh, New Zealand to Fiji before the pandemic cost about five and a half thousand dollars. After the pandemic, it's sixteen and a half thousand dollars. There's a shortage of containers. China, until recently, was very much locked down, most parts of it. China is the largest manufacturer of goods in the world. So when China is locked down, you have a lot of the containers locked up in China, there's non-availability of containers also, which has a huge impact on the cost of freight. We've been talking to shipping companies. They, they think that around about September, October, the cost of freight should start coming down. You know, a uh, lot of some people over here, maybe sugarcane farmers, before the uh, pandemic, the bag of fertilizer cost $45.65. The sugarcane farmer pays $20.00 government subsidizes $25.65. Before the Russia-Ukraine war, the price landed on, the, on our desk and it was $80. So the farmer does not, pay $20, uh, does not want to pay anything more than $20. Government has to pay $60. This is why you see in the revised budget that was delivered in March, April, there's more allocation being made for fertilizer. Now, of course, after the Russia-Ukraine war, things have changed even more. Many people did not know that Russia is the third, fourth largest producer of fuel in the world, oil. Ukraine has, uh, feeds about 400 million people in the world because they grow so much wheat. All of you eat purini, bambakao, roti, pani keke, bread. Everything is made from wheat. We don't grow wheat in Fiji. Two companies in Fiji make flour. Punja and Sons in Navutu in Latoka. FMF in Walu Bay, in Suva. They buy the wheat from Australia, they bring it to Fiji, they grind it, they put some vitamins in it, you get flour. They don't sell the flour to you directly. They sell it to the supermarket. Before they sell it to the supermarket, they go to the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission. They say, look, we bought our wheat for this much, say $300 a ton from Australia. This is my labor cost, my electricity cost then FCCC will say to them, you can make only this much margin. That's what you call wholesale price control. 
Then they sell it to say one of the supermarkets over here. And the supermarket will go to FCCC. And they will say, look, I bought it for this much from Punja and Sons. I'm renting a shop in Raki Raki. This is my labor cost, my electricity cost. They'll say, okay, before you sell it to the consumers, you can make only this much margin. That's what you call retail price control. Not all the items in Fiji are price control. Only certain what we call main items are price control, like flour. But if tomorrow the price of wheat being sold from Australia to uh, Punja and Sons or FMF goes up from $300 a ton to $400 a ton, obviously the price will go up, even though it's price control. If our friend here is importing fish from New Zealand to sell in the village canteen, if he's buying it from New Zealand with the price of the tin fish and the freight cost, he lands in Fiji for $5, he sells it to you in the village for $7, right? He makes a profit about $2. But if tomorrow New Zealand is going to sell it to him at $7, he's not going to sell it to you at $7, he's making no money. He'll put it up by another $2, he may sell it to you for $9. That's what's going to happen. In the same way, in the same way, you'll see that sometimes you have the cost, the imported inflation will have an impact on domestic goods. I'll explain to you. You see over here, this red line, that's what you call the imported inflation. You can see how, it, how it's increasing. This green line is domestic inflation. What we grow, what we have, and the price of that going up. But sometimes imported inflation, sometimes imported inflation, sometimes imported inflation can have an impact on domestic pricing. Sometimes imported inflation can have an impact on domestic pricing. I'll explain to you. Somebody may be in Singatoga Valley growing vegetables. They're growing vegetables, then they sell it to the middlemen. So, if you're growing vegetables in Singatoga Valley, and you may be selling, you know, a bunch of gobi or English cabbage for two dollars a sack, and the middleman buys that, then he takes it to Suva. If the price of fuel has gone up by 30-40%, the middleman will pass the price of that fuel onto the price of the gobi. That's what's going to happen. So that's why items like fuel has a huge impact on the economy. So, as I mentioned to you, the price of other things have gone up. The World Food Organization, they do what we call the price index, things like meat, dairy products, cereals, vegetable oils, sugar to an extent has gone up slightly. Not that much. I'm going to show you a video. Is that working now? I'm going to show you a video. Uh, this is from the World Economic Forum, which shows to you the impact of the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by the Russians, and what it's doing to the world market, and what impact it's having, for example, in uh, places like the, uh, you know, countries that rely on bread for the carbohydrate. We in Fiji are lucky. If tomorrow we don't get to eat bread, you can actually eat dalo and cassava and uto. That's your source of carbohydrate. Right? But in some countries, bread is their main source of carbohydrate. You know, when, we talk, when, they, when they talk about bread, it's not like the long loaf we have, the, the flat breads. It's made out of wheat. People in a lot of these countries are actually fighting over each other in the morning to be able to buy the bread. It's short supply. I was told about two, three, uh, last week, somebody said to me, of course, it needs to be verified that the uh, loaf of bread in the U.S. at the moment is costing about 8 U.S. dollars. It's a huge impact on the price of things all over the world. The U.S., of course, is one of the highest rates of inflation at the moment. We'll start this video now, and uh, please uh, listen to it. I hope the sound system works. I hope you can see it.
Ukraine grows enough food to feed 400 million people on planet Earth. So when the farmers on the battlefields aren't planting or aren't harvesting, what impact do you think that's going to have? catastrophe knocking and looming on the door for the fall uh, that will be not a price issue but a supply issue availability of food for people around the world and that will be a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe I mean, unfortunately, because there's too much light, you probably can't see the pictures really well. But you could read the script. Basically, a shortage supply of wheat. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they supply nearly 30% of the world's wheat and cereals. So obviously, there's a huge impact. Russia has a direct gas pipeline to Germany. They produce a lot of gas, so things like cooking gas. Now, of course, USA has told us, don't trade with Russia. There's a ban, trade ban, to punish them for invading Ukraine. The Europeans also have a trade ban with Russia to punish them for trading with Ukraine. As a result of the trade ban, of course, there's a shortage of supply of these things, which means the price of these things are going up. Like gas, I was telling you, Qatar, of course, extracts gas, but there's less gas now. If Russia is not able to sell its oil, there's a lot more pressure on the other countries to produce more oil. I mean, we were told that Biden is going to go to Saudi Arabia next week or sometime to talk to them about releasing more oil. There's more supplies and obviously the price of things will, should come down. So these are some of the challenges. Now, one of the most important things was that when the COVID came around, the issue was how did the country deal with the situation? As I mentioned to you earlier on, nearly everything we buy or use over here in terms of products is imported. A lot of the food items we eat are important. Of course, if you eat bele, bhaji, bindi, boda, uh, dal or cassava, that's locally grown. But many other things are imported. So, as I mentioned to you earlier on, also you need foreign reserves to be able to trade. You need foreign currency. If you don't have foreign currency, you won't be able to buy things. A lot of the medicine that you have is all imported. We don't have large pharmaceutical companies in Fiji. Fuel is all bought from Singapore. There are three fuel companies. They all buy the fuel from Singapore. So you need foreign currency to trade. So when COVID came around and we knew that government revenue halved, we knew that foreign exchange reserves were going to, um, you know, decrease exponentially, you know, in a large manner, then we said we need to make sure that we have enough foreign reserves to be able to trade. All governments in the world borrow money. Governments don't, they're not like a business, they're not like the shops. These shops always have to make a profit in whatever they sell to you. Right from the small Chinese lolly to the bag of flour. They have to make a profit. That's how they stay afloat. Governments, for certain things they provide to you, they don't get money from you. Right? So I, on the way here, one of the reasons why we were late is because you see all these upgrade of the roads in the upper Tailevu and Ra areas. They, these villages have now got street lights, they've got lights, they've got electricity, they've got footpaths. When we build those things, we don't go to the village and say, give us the money, then we'll build it. Right? When you go to the hospital, we don't say, give us $50, then you can use the hospital services. When you have this new market, we don't say, you give us money, then only then we'll build it. So government provides certain services that we'll, we won't be able to make money, but we have to do that. That's a job of a government. So when you actually do these things, you have to borrow money. When you go to a birth certificate at the moment, it's free. Before it used to be $2.25 at one stage. That's not enough money to even pay for the cost of the ink and the paper. So governments all over the world borrow money. The question you have to ask is, what are they borrowing the money for? 
and what is the cost of that money. So if we, for example, as a government decide that we'll build a nice big convention center on top of that hill over there, nice view of the Viti Levu Bay, so whenever a minister comes along, he or she can go and stay there. And it costs us $20 million to do it. That's what you call stupid use of money. You should not borrow money to do something like that. Right? But if you're going to borrow money to connect people to electricity up in the hills, to give them access to water, that's good use of money. Right? That's one thing. The second thing you have to ask is, what is the cost of the money? If this gentleman here decides to borrow $100,000, he goes to BSP Bank, he says, I'm doing this business, I need $100,000. They say, no problem. We'll give you the $100,000, three years to pay back 15% interest rate. Three years to pay back 15% interest rate. This lady here decides to also go and borrow $100,000. She goes to home finance. They say, no problem, we'll give you $100,000. 30 years to pay, 1% interest rate. Right? 30 years to pay, 1% interest rate, $100,000. 3 years to pay, 15% interest rate. If you look at both of them, both of them owe $100,000. You say, oh, they both they've got the same debt. But, who's better off? He's going to get high blood pressure. Because why? He has to make lots of money, Every month, do his repayment, he has to pay the entire loan in three years' time. And 15% interest rate. She's in relaxed mode. 30 years to pay. 1% interest rate. In the same way, when governments borrow, we have to make sure that the money we borrow costs less. During COVID, we borrowed money from the Japanese at 0.01%. 0.01%. Forty years to pay, ten year grace period. Grace period means for the first ten years you don't pay. Then you pay the money in the next thirty years. When you have a large amount of money being paid over forty years with zero percent zero uh, zero point zero one percent interest rate, you end up paying only forty percent of what you borrowed. In other words, it has a sixty percent grant element. The World Bank today is lending to us at zero percent interest rate, the IDA funds. 40 years to pay. By the time we end up paying the loan, we pay back only 45% of what we borrow. So when people come, I know it's election year, people come and talk to you about interest rates and or talk about debt. Right? They'll come and talk to you about that. But you have to be smart enough to question them on that. Some of these journalists, they write about things like that without doing any checks on that. So you have to, you know, a bit more understanding about it. And that's what we have done. Now, when we borrowed money, normally when governments borrow money, at least this government has been borrowing money in normal times, about 70% of what we borrow, we borrow from Fiji, from Fijian entities like FNPF, like insurance companies, banks. They like to buy government bonds because they make money from government bonds. It's solid investment. They know they'll get paid back. And about 30% we borrow from overseas, plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 5%. The reason why we borrow more locally is because we don't want foreign currency exposure. Now, during COVID, we actually borrowed more from overseas. Two reasons. Why did we do that? When we borrow more from overseas during the pandemic, it meant new money came in. New money came in because there's less money in the economy. New money came in, and it came in foreign currency. In other words, the foreign reserves went up. And secondly, of course, it, it, by having new money into the economy, there's liquidity increased. In other words, we knew that once the borders would open, businesses will want to borrow money. And want to borrow money, the interest rate should be less. So those are some of the measures we took. Now, some countries, unfortunately, did not do that. Some countries, of course, had economic problems before that. The next video I'm going to show you is from Sri Lanka, which will show you the rate of inflation went up so high that people, even though they were working, they could not afford to buy basic food items. 
a person working for him uh, for himself and his family could only feed himself with the amount of money he earned and a result of inflation and job losses people had to set up community kitchens to feed themselves I'll, let me show that video to you now and i'll go back onto the uh, inflation issue helping put food on the table community kitchens like this are starting up around sri lanka as people struggle with its worst economic crisis in more than 70 years food inflation has hit nearly 60 percent and many people are finding it difficult to cope most of these community who are coming today or uh, been coming are surviving with two meals so we are giving them the responsibility of surviving for one meal and we are saying right we will support you with one meal but a good healthy meal few now get to eat this well it's very difficult we rarely get food like this only my husband is working but what he earns for a day is not enough to feed the three of us now tax cuts three years ago slashed government revenue by more than two billion dollars the tourism industry was then damaged by the Easter bombings and the pandemic now there is no money to import fuel medicine cooking gas or food Right now, actually, our main focuses are on food banks, on community kitchens, and again, long to medium term uh, community gardens and home gardens, because we can give rations, but it's very short term. The government is appealing for help. We urgently require the assistance of our friends in the international community to ensure that our immediate needs in terms of the importation of essential medicine, food supply, and poor army. India and China have sent food and medicine in recent days. The opposition says the government has weakened the economy through populist policies and mismanagement. A nationwide campaign dubbed Gota Go Home has been running for two months, calling on the president to resign. The government is seeking a loan package from the International Monetary Fund or IMF. Critics say it'll take too long, even if agreed, and people need action now. Tens of thousands of Sri Lankans are going hungry amid the country's worst economic crisis in decades. Community kitchens like this can only feed a fraction of them. Minal Fernandez, Al Jazeera, Colombo. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned to you, you see the inflation rate in the United States at the moment is 8.5%. Uh, European area is 8.8%. Um, Australia is 5.1%. New Zealand is 69 United Kingdom is 9.1%. Japan is the lowest. It's sitting at about 25 Fiji is around about 5 at the moment. We expect it to go up slightly more. But that's the rate of inflation all over the world. It's not something peculiar to Fiji. The World Food Organization, you can see here, they track the price of food, what we call the food index, price index, um, cereal, meat price, oil prices, all of this is actually going up. The only one that sort of remained fairly stable is sugar. You can see sugar is kind of leveled off here, which is sadly unfortunate for us because if we had a high price of sugar, we'd be able to get a lot more income from sugar. But all the other things have actually gone up. So, as you know, in the revised budget, we said that 21 items would be VET, zero-rated VET, 21 items. So, if we did not do this in the revised budget, all of you would be paying 9% more. By us making it 0%, government has lost revenue about $165 million. If you paid VET on those things, we would have collected $165 million more. But we forego that because we know that these are the items that we, help, we need to help people to meet their you know, daily uh, expenditure. Now, what is really interesting is this. You look at sugar. Okay, sugar is produced locally. Flour comes from wheat, 100% imported. Most of the rice you eat is imported. Most of the canned fish you eat is imported. Cooking oil, all made overseas, all imported. Potatoes, we don't grow potatoes. A few potatoes here and there, but... All the potatoes you buy is from New Zealand. Onions, New Zealand, 100%. Uh, 
We don't grow garlic. You can't have meaty without onions, right? You can't make a curry without onions and garlic. These are essential items that people use for these foods. Baby milk imported. Powdered milk, 100% imported. They, only, they buy it in bulk and package it here. Red cow, dairy milk and all that kind of stuff. Liquid milk, most of it is imported. There's about, we produce about 10 million liters of milk. Dal all imported, tea all imported, salt all imported, soap mainly imported, soap powder imported, toilet paper some made locally, sanitary pads for women all imported, toothpaste mainly imported, kerosene imported, cooking gas all imported. So you can see from that, the things that you buy on a daily basis, how much of it is, comes from Fiji, how much of it comes from overseas. The people don't realize this. And they don't realize that we actually need foreign currency for this. So what have we been doing? A lot of people don't appreciate the fact that if we had not taken those measures, if we had not borrowed more from overseas and changed the permutation during the COVID period, our dollar could have been devalued. The dollar did not get devalued. Can you imagine if the dollar got devalued? What you're buying now from overseas would have cost you far more. Far, far more. So the fact that we had macroeconomic stability meant that the dollar did not get devalued. We paid over five, we paid about $500 million, I should say, $500 million in what we call livelihood support. And I'll very quickly show you, and I'll come back to this slide. That's how much we paid. So this first lot here, $205 million. For these were the, for the people who had jobs, formal jobs. You know, they had FNPF paid for them. So when they lost their jobs, we said that they could uh, withdraw money from the general account, a set amount of money every fortnight. But when their money ran out of the general account, then government paid it for them into the general account. And they could withdraw $225 a fortnight. So we paid $205 million to about close to 69,000 Fijians in that manner. And then we had the $90 payout. As you know, that we, uh, the story that I told you earlier on, there are a lot of people in Fiji who actually in, uh, rely on the informal sector. A lot of the people here, for example, when they sell their stuff, they're not working for anybody. They're working for themselves. They don't have FNPF to rely on. And if they lost their jobs, they lost their income because of lockdown or because they were working for or supplying to a particular industry that is no longer operational, we wanted to help them too. So initially we said $90 per household. But then we found a lot of people are chortling from the system. One household, five people applying for $90. So then we said $50 per person. So $90, we paid about $10.6 million. $50 per person, first round, 224,000 Fijians got money, $11.2 million. Second round, $50, 205,000 Fijians, $10.2 million. And then, of course, the famous 360. The 360 first round, 294,924 Fijians assisted, $106 million got paid. Second round, $87 million got paid. Recently, as announced in the revised budget, we gave, uh, we, you know, those people need assistance in one level, we got, got $100. In all of this, from round one, round two, round three, all of this were only for Viti Levu. Viti Levu got hit the hardest. In the 360, mainly from BT Levu, some people from Banwa Levu who actually were on the FNPF scheme and they got paid out uh, for that amount of money. Now, what is really interesting, which a lot of people forget, is that when you went to get the 360, you did not have to go to the DO's office, the Turangani Koro or provincial administrator or the advisory councillor or the Ministry of Women. You actually applied on these things. You said in your home and you applied for it on their phone. And you got paid on your phone. Right? You got paid on your phone, you applied on your phone. No lining up. Can you imagine if all that many people had to go and line up somewhere? Can you imagine if 294,000 people, in fact, there were over 300,000 people who applied, some got disqualified because some wanted to off, off try and bypass the system. But imagine 294,000 people queuing up everywhere. Four, five-hour line, 
Then people will have complained, I'm standing here for five hours, I need water, I'm fainting, it's hot, the sun, it's cold, whatever. But we paid that out. Now other countries are looking at how we did it. They're looking at Fiji as an example. So that's how much money we paid. Now, the importance of this was this. We know that some people who got 360, maybe some people went and spent it all on beer at George's shop. Right? They all went and bought beer at his shop, he benefited from it. But bulk of the people who got the money, they bought food, they bought shoes, they bought clothes, some paid their rent, and maybe somebody spent $20 on beer. That's okay. The point is though, when the economy is already shrinking, when you pump money into the economy, what will actually happen is that people benefit from it. So somebody may have gone to the supermarket to do the shopping, they would have hired a carrier. So the carrier driver gets some money. Some people would have hired a taxi, the taxi driver gets some money. The supermarket may have become busy, they may have said, okay, I'll hire somebody to work for me for the next one week. So somebody will go to have a job. So you need the economy to move when the government actually pumps in the money and that's how the economy kept on being afloat. That's why we had people still having a relative amount of income within the economy. Let me go back to where we were. So, you know, a lot of people, they, they had loans with the banks. Like somebody may have been working at a hotel, may have had a $1,500 loan, $2,000 loan, some small loans. Banks did what they call provisioning. Provisioning basically means that they expect those loans not to be paid. Over $100 billion was provisioned for by the banks. Despite that, all the banks in Fiji are afloat. Despite that, all the banks in Fiji actually are doing well. Some, in fact, have made money too, a substantial amount of money in the past couple of years. We reduced ECAL, no more ECAL. Departure tax was reduced from $200 to $100. No more stamp duties. You want to set up a business, you can set up a business. No need for a business license anymore. You don't need to pay for that. It's easy. Unless, of course, you're selling cooked food, you need the health inspector's you know, approval and all of that. We gave it uh, a credit guarantees, a loan scheme, COVID-19. You could get loans from FDB and various other banks that participate in the scheme. You don't pay interest rate for the first two years. You don't do any principal payments. Only in the third year you start doing the payments. That was to assist people. Over hundred million dollars has been disbursed in that way. So again, a lot of people have started up their businesses or renewed their businesses. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of people in Fiji are, you know, talking about debt. A lot of politicians are talking about debt. Unfortunately, a lot of media organizations are writing about debt without understanding debt. If you look at most of the countries in the world, all of their debt to GDP ratio increased substantially. New Zealand, which is normally a low debt country, the debt to GDP ratio is 28% before the pandemic. Today, it's 52%, almost double. Even Australia, 42%. Australia has been growing before the pandemic for about 23 years. We were only growing for nine years before the pandemic came. They've been growing for about 23 years. Even though it's 1%, 1.5%, 1 2%, but the fact is it was growing. Even a country like that has been growing for 23 years. The debt to GDP ratio went from 42% to 62%. Malaysia, Seychelles, these are tourism countries, St. Lucia in the Barbados, Mauritius. They jump from 66 to 101 percent. Maldives, they get a lot of, they like us, a very tourism driven country. They have over a million tourists. Most of the tourists come from Russia, China, Ukraine, etc., Europe. Their debt to GDP ratio has gone from 72 percent to 137 percent. We are obviously sitting at 46 and we went up to 80 percent. Now, a lot of people don't realize that whenever there's a cyclone and the schools get damaged, Government has to build the schools, even though government does not own the school, right? So you have schools owned by the Methodist Church, the Catholic Church, Arya Samaj, Sanatan Dhara, Muslim League, Seven Day, or you have community-based schools. They're all owned by the community. Maybe the village school or some community, some cane growing area, they have started a school, you know, 40, 50 years ago. The land, the property is owned by those 
individual organizations. But there's an expectation when there's a cyclone, government will come and build. After Cyclone Winston, we spent over $200 million just to rebuild schools. Just to rebuild schools, we spent $200 million. Altogether in Cyclone Winston, we spent $500 million to build road, bridge, jetty, highways, got washed away, Irish crossings, all of that. Because Cyclone Winston, in 36 hours, wiped off one-third of the value of our GDP. So despite that, our debt-to-GDP ratio was still very low compared to what we went through, 46%, but of course, after pandemic, it went up to 80%. And this is what I was talking about. So before, before the thinking was that, that the pie will always be this size. So if I want to give somebody something to Ra, I have to take it from Tailevu. If I want to give something to Nanroga, I have to take something from Bua. Because they always assume the pie will be one size. What we have been doing is we've been increasing the size of the pie. So everybody benefits. And that means, you can see that, our debt to GDP ratio, even though the dollar value of the debt was going up, our debt to GDP ratio is coming down because the economy is growing. You know, some people have said, oh, what's the use? Where's the Beni Marama boom? That's the boom. You see a lot more cars in Fiji today. Far more cars. People don't buy cars if they don't have money. Certain uh, rural areas, they used to, it was a big deal to have a car. Today, now everybody's got a car. People have higher levels of what you call disposable income. So, you know, in the same way, if this gentleman here, if he earns half a million dollars a year, when he goes to the bank, he can borrow more from somebody who may earn $10,000 a year. Right? It only makes sense. He's got more money at his disposal, he can borrow more. So, just to give you a perspective, what is debt to GDP ratio? If this gentleman has $100 and he goes and borrows $20, in simple terms, you would say debt to GDP ratio is 20%. 20 over 100 is 20%. This lady has, <coughs> if she borrows, 500, uh, borrows $50, but she has $500. She's borrowing $50, two and a half times more than his. He's borrowing only $20. $20. You would say her debt to GDP ratio is only 10%, even though she's borrowing home. Why? Because she's got $500. So what's the dollar value of our debt? You know, people measure, you can measure uh, debt in dollar value. You know how we talked about 100,000, 100,000? This is in US dollars. Normally, internationally, when you measure debt, you measure it in US dollars. Billion, this is the billion dollars here. Bahamas, which is a tourism country, their debt is 11.4 billion US dollars. Much smaller country than us, a tourism-based country. 11.4 billion dollars. Mauritius, 11.2 billion dollars. Barbados, 6.6 .6 billion US dollars. 11.4 billion dollars US would be about, um, about 22, 23 billion Fijian dollars. Fijian debt is 3.7 billion US dollars, which is about 8, 8 billion uh, Fijian dollars. So you can see where we sit in comparison to the other countries. Now, these are small tourism-based countries like ours. If you want, let's compare ourselves with the big boys and girls. This is in trillion dollars, not billion, but trillion dollars. The US is the most debt-ridden country in the world. It owes, I'm talking about the dollar value of debt, 30.5 trillion dollars. Not billion, but trillion, which is the next one up. Next one is Japan. Japan has got a debt of 13 trillion. China, 12.8 12, uh, 12 uh, trillion. UK, 3 trillion. India, 2.8 trillion. These are all US dollars. Australia is 976.7 billion dollars. Singapore is 527.28 billion. Malaysia, New Zealand, New Zealand is 121.6 billion dollars. So you can see from this, you see New Zealand's dollar value of their debt is 1.216 billion dollars. New Zealand's debt to GDP ratio is 52%. 
lower than ours, which is 80%, but the dollar value of their debt is, ours is 3.7 billion. Theirs is 121 billion. So dollar value is a lot higher. You have to understand that. <clears throat> In the same way I gave the example. That this gentleman, he's $100, he borrows $20, is 20%. But the dollar value is $20. She borrows $50. Dollar value is higher, but as a percent of GDP is much lower because she has actually has five hundred dollars. I talked to you about foreign reserves. <clears throat> so in 2010, for example, we had 1.3 billion foreign reserves. Now this is you can't see it unfortunately. This line here shows you how many months of trading we could do. The International Monetary Monetary Fund says you should have at least three months worth of foreign reserves to be able to trade, to be seen to be healthy. So today we have $3.4 billion, we could trade for about eight months. Over here, even though we had $2 billion, we could only trade for four months. Why? Because the economy is moving very fast. When people are constructing buildings, people are buying lots of cars, we need more foreign reserves. Why? Why? Because most of the things we use are from overseas. Right, if tomorrow everybody starts building in Fiji and you start buying lots of cars and buying lots of things that comes from overseas, you need more foreign reserves. I talked to you about liquidity, how much money there is in the banking system. Normally, when you have more money in the banks, the interest rate will come down. You can see over here, we have $348 million in foreign reserves, interest rate of 7.4%. Today we have $2.4 billion in the banking system, the interest rate is 5.5%. Sorry, 5.8%. See, because banks, they make money not by having lots of money in the bank. Banks make money by lending you money. Banks make money from money, not by making, accumulating lots of money. Because when the bank gets money, they lend it to you. And the interest, the sood, is what they make their profit from. Remember that. So, when there's lots of money in the banks, when you want to go and borrow money because they're all competing with each other, the interest rates will come down. If you go today now, because there's lots of money in the bank, if you want to put some money in term deposit, you'll get a low interest rate. So they may give it to you for 1%. When they take your term deposit, they take your term deposit, they lend it to him at maybe 6 or 7%. But if the interest rate is already down in the market, they'll pay you far less money because they don't need your money. They want to use their money to make money from that. So that's why for us it was very important that we, when we thought about these policies, we need to have more liquidity because we knew that once the economy starts opening up, people will want access to money. But it has to be cheap. Some companies at the moment in Fiji are paying only 4% interest rate. So I've talked to you about this. I mean, what are the downsides <coughs> of the economy? There are two things that are risks for us at the moment. One of them, obviously, is the Russia-Ukraine war. We don't know how long it's going to last. I'd love it if they ended next week. If they end it next week, Russian fuel will come into the market, the wheat will come into the market, the price of those things will come down automatically. It will benefit all of us globally. God forbid it spreads to other countries. There was some talk about it spreading to other countries. We don't know. We don't know how long it's going to go on for. That's an unknown. That's something completely out of our control. The other thing that's completely out of our control is cyclones. Cyclone season. I'm old enough to know, some of you are old enough to know, the big cyclone in 1972 was Hurricane Bibi. Big, big deal it was then. The next big cyclone came after 10 years. After 10 years, next big one. Today in Fiji, if you don't get three cyclones in a year, you think we're doing well. Every year we get a cyclone. Now, this year we had one cyclone, Cyclone Cody. Only one cyclone, but it rained so much that it washed away so many things. It damaged crops, Irish crossings got washed away. If you travel between Singatoka and uh, Nandi, there's a place called Kambisi, the entire highway went. Big hole in the ground. 
Now why is Samo a lane went in Ba? Lots of places got washed away. No cyclone, but because it's too much rain. Now when that happens, we don't have money set aside to say, oh, we know there's going to be a big hole in Kambisi. Let's set aside five million dollars for that. We don't know that. So if we, for example, have a project here to maybe spend half a million dollars to connect some village or some cane growing area to electricity, it's going to cost us half a million dollars. But suddenly if the highway gets washed away because of a cyclone, we're going to stop that project, use that money from there to fix up the highway. Because that's more important. That electricity can wait. Sometimes, of course, people get upset by that. But it's better to have the highway fixed up than not to have electricity. We've been without it for a while. You can do without it for a while. We can do it next year, the following year. But if you don't fix up the highway, you can't get goods to Raki Raki. If we don't fix up the reservoir system because it got damaged, you won't have water in the tap. That's more important. So cyclones have to, they force us to reprioritize projects. In the same way, we had a lot of uh, rural electrification projects. We had to put it on hold because of the COVID-19. We have to make sure that we spend money on people getting food on the table, pay out the 360, pay out the 50, pay out the FNPF benefit. That's more important. People need more money in their pocket to buy their food than, for example, do rural electrification. If I say to you, do you want food or you want electricity, if you have the choice, you want the food, right, first. So that's what we have to do in terms of reprioritization. There's a number of things, of course, that you know, we obviously put in place in terms of uh, regulation, technology. <clears throat> what was really interesting, in uh, last year, we had the highest level of exports in the agriculture sector. Three key areas that uh, increased cost substantially was Yongona, Kava, Ginger, and Turmeric, you know, Haldi. Because huge demand for it. Because, you know, people now see turmeric in America, they've said it's a superfood. A lot of people have known it for centuries, it's a superfood. They put haldi on their skin, they drink haldi with a glass of milk. It's good for the bones, it's good for your arteries, it makes it more flexible, you don't get blockages. Those kind, it helps not getting blockages. Those are the kind of things, so people have discovered that. You know, food like seijan or moringa, those things are now seen to be a superfood. Huge demand for it. So there are the new areas of growth in agriculture and as you know in the pandemic we also gave out seeds to farmers, we gave out seeds to people in the backyard, backyard gardens to grow more foods and vegetables. <clears throat> there is uh, also some interesting things that's happening now in the market. Globally there's a shortage of, uh, of skill sets in some of the countries. In, uh, in Melbourne about two weeks ago you would have seen an ABC story where the hospital, the public hospital, the waiting time of the hospital is 24 hours. 24 hours. Why? Because they've got a shortage of nurses. And in fact, uh, a couple of days ago, in some places, a shortage of GPs, private doctors. A lot of people got scared because of the pandemic. They don't do, they change the profession, etc. What will that mean? It, mean look, it means that they will look for nurses from overseas. I was talking to somebody from one of the health centers in from Suva. They said five or six of the nurses have gone to overseas. We've got nurses now in the Middle East, in UAE. In England, they're bringing nurses from India to work in the health system. There's a huge movement globally in the health sector. So that could have an impact on us. So when we do the budget, we have to look at things like how many scholarships we'll give, how much funding we'll give for nurses. Today in Fiji, 65% of the population is below the age of 35. 70% is below the age of 40. So all of you over the age of 40, you in the minority. Right. So when you have a young population, you'll get more babies, biologically speaking. A young population has more chances of having younger babies, more babies. Old people don't make babies. Young people make babies. So when we do the budget, we have to think what are the services we need to put in place to look after these people that are going to come? In Japan, you can go to a supermarket and a 70-year-old, a 75-year-old will be packing your groceries because the bulk of the population is old. A, what we call an aging population. Australia is heading that way too. You've got an aging population. 
So like in Australia, they want health, they want what you call aged care services. We have a lot of Fijian women in particular in, in USA, some legally, some illegally, providing aged care services. They look after old people, what we call like old people's home. But in fact, they live in their homes. They food, uh, they, they bathe them, they look after them, they give them their medicine. And these people, they work there, they get paid some of them, we had paid 150 US dollars a day. They give them accommodation, they give them food. So there's a, there's a huge shift. Australia wants more people like that. In New Zealand, there's a shortage of waiters and waitresses. People don't want to work in the hospitality sector. There's been articles published only recently. So a lot of the restaurants, they're not opening full time. A lot of the hotels are finding it hard to open because they don't have enough people to work in the hotels. So what do you think they will do? They'll try and steal our people. They don't have enough fruit pickers. There's a company here just last week looking for people to walk in the abattoirs to kill animals so they can export those animals. So it could also mean that we will lose our people. A few weeks ago, there's an advertisement in, uh, I think it was Fiji Sun, or I don't know which newspaper it was, I saw the advert, where Australian recruiting agencies were trying to hire chefs from Fiji. If you had more than three years experience as a chef, they're offering from 80 to 120 thousand dollars. Now if our chefs go, who's going to cook our food in our hotels? We want the tourists to come to Fiji. We want them to have a good food experience also. So all of these changes are taking place globally. So what you need is you need stable policies. You need forward-looking policies. You need people, you need to think outside the box. So we have to make some adjustments too. So when we do the budget, we have to think, okay, the budget is not only about this year, this coming year. It's not only about the inflation. It's also about how do we frame the budget so we have things, the right things happening in five years' time, in ten years' time. A budget is not only about for the year, it's also about the future. The one sector that grew in the, uh, during the pandemic was what we call the BPO sector, business processing outsourcing. 3,000 new jobs were created from what we've been told by the BPO Council. We actually gave them in the budget about $200,000 to get more, more business for Fiji. BPO is this, is that if this gentleman lives in Australia and he calls up his bank or he calls up his insurance company because there's been a burglary in his house and he wants to make a claim through the insurance company, wants to know what to do or wants to apply online. He'll ring up the number in Australia There'll be somebody in Fiji answering the phone call and saying, how can you help you this, this morning, sir? They'd rather do that, have somebody in Fiji answering the call because it's cheaper for them to do it in Fiji. That's what we call outsourcing. Some people are doing their tax returns from Fiji for Australian taxpayers. It's cheaper for them to do that in Fiji. We are English speaking. We are well qualified people. We're in the right time zone. Apparently our accents are easy to understand. So those are the advantages we have. The Australians who are working with us on this, one of their consultants has said that they think that there'll be 100,000 jobs created in this sector in the next 10 years. So as you know, government has expended a lot of, in, uh, expended a lot of funds in the telecommunications. You saw TFL doing the fiber optic cable around Vitilevu. They're going to lay a fiber optic cable from Savu Savu to Lambasa. So all those are what we call the new areas of growth, new economic opportunities for us. So that's what we focused on also. As you know, minimum wage uh, has gone up by, uh, to $4. It'll reach $4 by, the, uh, by January of uh, next year. Every quarter it increases to reach $4. Now, a lot of people don't know the difference between minimum, national minimum wage and minimum wage for other sectors. National minimum wage means for any job, for any job, you can't pay anything less than the minimum wage, national minimum wage, so $4. So somebody comes to cut grass at your house, you must pay them $4 an hour. That's what it means. Somebody comes and digs a foundation in your house, for your house, you have to pay them $4 an hour. Right? That's what we call national minimum wage. But there are other sectors that have a higher minimum wage. So forklift driver's minimum wage is a lot higher than the national minimum wage. A boiler maker, an electrician, they have different wage rates. So when we increase the minimum wage to $4 an hour, we say that those ones also need to increase. So that's, 
this national minimum wage. Now, when we set the national minimum wage, we don't pull the, air, the figure out from the air. We bring an independent consultant. There's been a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Patak. He comes from Australia. He looks at the, thing, the economy. He looks at you know, the uh, prevailing circumstances, looks at how many people are employed. Now, a lot of people are now, of course, because election year, they want to pull figures out of, the, out of the thin air. Some are saying $7, some are saying $5. What Dr. Patak also does this, assuming that this gentleman is a small business, right? assuming he's got a tire repair shop and he employs seven people. If today he's paying 268 and tomorrow is, and you say to him from tomorrow or next week you have to start paying everybody four dollars or pay, start paying five dollars, he'll say, look, I can't afford it. I can't pay everybody the same, that rate. Maybe out of the seven, I'll let three go and I'll employ the other four. So he also looks at those things too, because when we increase minimum wage, we don't want people to lose their jobs. So people who pull figures out of the air, they don't have any science behind it. They don't have any studies behind it. This we have done so. We said that we'll review minimum wage every two years. We last reviewed in 2018. Obviously we could not do it in 2020 because there was a pandemic. And then as soon as the pandemic got out of it, we did a review. In the budget, of course, we'll continue to invest in education, health services, infrastructure, connectivity, public utilities. In education, <clears throat> we spend $700 million a year. For the past number of years, we've spent $700 million a year. Even though we had COVID, from EC to year 13, we still continue with free education. We still continue with free textbooks. Can anybody tell me how much we pay the civil servant salary every year? Take a guess. Sorry? No, in dollar value. You should know this. We pay $1.1 billion a year in civil service salary. It includes the police, corrections, all the ministries, the DOs, all everybody. 1.1 billion. Our expenditure is about three, in excess of $3 billion. So nearly one third of what we spend is in wages. And of course, I came down by a car today, the fuel cost, the photocopying paper, the rental cost, we're renting some business, uh, offices here, we pay the rent. And then the rest of the money is to make things, build things. The three main components, what is the, what you call the operational cost, and the other is the capital expenditure. So, education, even though it was hard, we still put money in education because as I mentioned to you, 65% of the population is below the age of 35. So we have to make sure our young people are educated to a particular level. If they want to go to university, we can pay for it. If they want to do TVET courses, they want to do you know, other sort of type of skill sets, what we call vocational courses, we'll pay for it. In COVID, we reduced some of it. Of course, now we're going to increase it even more as we did in the revised budget. So, out of the $700 million, we spend about, we've allocated $156.5 million just for tells and toppers. Now, there's been a lot of talk about this. So, the tells and toppers are two things, just you know, in case you have young, young children in your house. Is that... <clears throat> Toppers is when you score a particular mark in a different area of study that we, we look for those skill sets. So most of the toppers scholarships that we give are based on our need. We don't give toppers for lawyers. There are too many lawyers. Right? But we need marine scientists. We need foresters. We need land surveyors. We need nurses. We need specialized doctors. So all those areas we give a high priority. We need engineers. Those areas we give high priority for toppers. About 80 to 85 percent goes in those areas. So if somebody, for example, is a topper and he gets, a, uh, gets to do marine science, Mar uh, USP is a marine science school, they go there. We pay for the accommodation, we pay for the university fees, we pay for the books, any other expenses. When they finish their course, they don't pay us back a single cent. They just simply have to work in Fiji. Because we spend money on you. You have to work in Fiji. You don't even have to work for government. 
You can go and work for any agency, anybody in Fiji, any organization in Fiji, but you work in Fiji. Now, if I, for example, am a top off and does medicine, I've done medicine, that's a lot of money. Medicine is the highest amount of money you spend. So you have to work in Fiji for eight years. You can go and work as a private doctor, you can go and work for government, you can go and work for any other agency. You work in Fiji for eight years. Hopefully you work in Fiji for the rest of your life. But minimum is eight years. If you want to leave Fiji before that and you want to migrate, if you spend four years in Fiji, that means you've done four, uh, 50 percent. Then you pay back the 50 percent before you leave. It's only fair. We've had in the beginning, we've had people, for example, who had tells and they said to us, we're going overseas, we'll be back. They never came back. So the money is basically, they've, they've made, they, they've got their qualification, qualification from Fiji, used Fiji and money and they've now gone overseas. That's not fair. For the first time in Fijian history, we made education completely free. We're giving people access to toppers and tells. Obviously, we need to contribute. Remember, we can't only think about today. We've got 65% of the population are below the age of 35. The young people's children will soon come too. Who's going to pay for them? You have to have a sustainable system. Tells is when, you, when you're not a topper, but you still pay for you to go to university. And if you, for example, you graduate, you have to pay the loan back. Now, the way it's paid is, you only pay back once you start working. So if I graduate today and I don't have a job for one year, I don't do any payments. And only when you start working, then you take out a small percentage from your salary. The Fiji Revenue Customs will do it. But if you pay 50% of your loan in three years' time, the other 50% we forgive. We write it off. So now we're talking to some of the, some of the banks are very interested in this. Because they want, what they want to do now is they say, look, we'll pay the 50%. For them now, you forgive the other 50% and that 50% they pay, they can take a small loan from the bank. It's a win-win situation for everybody. But that's the system around tells and toppers. So ladies and gentlemen, I mean, uh, that's the end of it. You can go, what I've said is all available on this website, the economy uh, website, the Fijian government website. We've also published a lot more information. Now under the law, we are required to publish the state of the economy, um, you know, and during the election time. So all that information is available to everybody and you can do your own analysis from that. And indeed, you can, uh, you know, uh, announce any policies from that too. I'd like to open up the floor. As I said, please, if you have any personal issues, please go to the staff at the back. Uh, give in the interest of time, because we have to go to Nandi also. Um, if you have personal issues, please talk to the staff. If you want to make any submissions, you want to ask any questions, any comments to make, you can do so. Okay? And you can speak in any language you like. And we, people can translate it for us. Okay? Uh, please put your hand up. Somebody will come to you with a mic. And don't be uh, shy or frightened to ask any question or make any comment. Naka, thanks. The Honourable Minister, welcome to Reki Reki, sir. And uh, we have uh, already listened to your suggestions. Uh, there are a few uh, areas that I need to, to focus on. Is first is, uh, is our interest rates in the bank. I suppose uh, just a few weeks ago, the Honourable Minister for Agriculture was here in Rekreki on uh, the implementation uh, a process of the ginger farming, which $700,000 was being given by the New Zealand government. I asked the FDB that day that the interest rates on the, on the farming, especially on the sugarcane farming, and uh, I think the, the manager was here from Rekiriki branch, probably is here today, now, from FDB, Rekiriki, the manager? Okay, sir. And uh, he told us that it's 9%. 9% on the agricultural loans, especially on the cane farming. And uh, commercial banks probably give up to 5%. And the sugarcane support fund 
gives up to 6% of the interest rates. My request over here is said that it's a Fiji Development Bank. It is the development of the common people of this nation on the agriculture sector. And I'll come on the commercial sector, sir. This is my request if the interest rates of the FDB would be reduced, probably compared to the sugarcane support farm to maybe 5 or 6 percent. This is just a request to you, sir. And also on the, on the commercial loans, uh, the business community go to the banks like Bread Bank or uh, Barora or uh, BSP or ANZ or Westpac, probably comes up to 5 percent. And sometimes when you are in the good books, they might come up to 4.5 percent. As you have explained, just because the foreign reserve for that, uh, that uh, the area on the commercial uh, banks is too much. Now, compared to 4.5 percent on commercial banks, and our bank would be the Fiji Development Bank. That is our bank. But their interest rate is about 13.5 percent. So this is one request to you, sir, that if that also be, can be reduced so that more business can be given and also the 10 deposits would be observed. I think that this year, though, maybe from last year, they started to get the 10 deposit. That is one of the areas that, uh, that we are requesting to the government. Say, so on the second issue is the, the agriculture sector, which is very, very important for our country. And I know you supported me very much on that when we opened the pack house here in Rekireki. Whenever I made a call to you, you always asked for this pack house. But I know you are short of time, otherwise I would have taken you to the pack house and see that what we are doing. I think, uh, for example, as you has explained, if somebody from Nata City, from uh, Korosule, brings 10 bags of cassava to, to Suva to sell it for one week, that week he gets about $50 a bag. He's so happy to get $500, buy goods, some in the bank, some for the children's education, and goes back again to Korosule. The next week, he brings another 10 bags, but the price has gone down to $10 a bag. He'll just have $100 in his pocket. In the third week, Honorable Minister, he's not going to be bring the cassava back to the supermarket. So the what I have requested to the Honorable Minister for Agriculture and the, and the CEO, who is a very humble man, that market is very, very important to us. Eh? At the moment, we are, uh, we are supplying to New Zealand three containers of cassava and dalo. We might go to four containers. And this is where, in the, in the, in the agriculture sector, everybody gets the business, as you said that if the price is going to come down, employment will be given. That is, that is what the government's duty is. So my request is to get the market. Tamarind market, as you explained, is two billion market in America. And in Canada, it's two billion market. We have requested the Ministry for Agriculture to find the market for us. We have got a lot of Tamarind here in the province of Ra. So this is one request to you on the, on the agriculture sector, sir. On the on the rent of the, the crown land. Probably we had 99 years of lease. That was something very good for our farmers. But what happened, that every five years assessment will be done on valuation. On the first year, it was $400. When the next assessment came over, it was $1,200. When the third assessment would come, it might go up to $1,800. If the fourth assessment would come, it might go up to $2,400. But that area produces only 200 tons of cane, which is a net profit of about $4,000. Though the farmer will only get $1,200, but the rent will be $2,400, eh? So that's one area that I request to the government on the subsidy on our rent, not only to the, to the Crown land, but also to the TLTB. We have got $390 million lying down in the sugarcane support fund. This was all mostly the, the, the FSC freehold, that's the FSC freehold land. If that can also be, it might be a long process, eh? but that might be, if that money would be 
given back to the government and make all this crown land, crown central sea land, a freehold land for the farmers. So that we'll never pay, never pay any, any rent to the, to, to the government. That is, that, is, that is my request to you, sir. I mean, we know we are going through a hard life, not only Fiji, but the whole world. Honorable Minister, look at me, look at me, sir, look at me, sir. Yeah. Look at me, sir. This is, this is what I'm requesting to you, sir. So this is very, very important. That this is a request that I'm making to the government. The, the third issue is the mismanagement of funds, as you have said, correctly said, sir. The government budget can go up to $3 billion. But the mismanagement fund is so pointing to us here in the province of Rekereke, and I'm going to give you one good example. They started to build the Gallau Road. They started to build the Gallau Road. What happens here? At a rainy weather, we know that from November to, to May, it's a, it's a rainy weather not only to the Western Division, but whole of Fiji. They started to bring up the soil. Honorable Minister, they, want, they bring up the soil and, and they took over all those, about, about eight kilometers. And what happened? The flooding came over. The flooding came over, sir, and they washed all that soil that was dumped at, on the road. My question is, the mismanagement of government funds is our taxpayers' money. What they would have done, the engineers were hired from Sri Lanka with, with a healthy salary. But what happened? All washed out. Millions of dollars of tax money gone. They would have, they had, no matter it's a rainy weather, they would have gone to a half kilometer, completed the half kilometer with the gravel, with the uh, chips, and went to another half kilometer. But this, this is a misinvent of fund of the Gala. And the people suffered, sir. The people really suffered. The vehicles would be bogged on that on that soil. So this is one of the areas. We as taxpayers, we watch every day. That's because I pay good tax to the government, sir. And it is my prime duty that what is the tax is, I'm going to pay. But at the end of the day, is the mismanagement of funds on the roads. And I think Ministry for Education, Ministry for Health, and Ministry for Roads and Energy takes the bunch of the, of the cake of the budget of every year. So this is one request again to you, sir. To listen. It's not that I'm going to blame you, Honorable Minister, or the Prime Minister, or anybody that matter. But it is a request that we see every day what is happening. That is what we need to bring it over. And it's very hard for you. I know I can make you a call. You answer the call instantly. Whenever you pass my house, you give me a call. I mean, this is a, it's not a matter of opposition. It's not a matter of government. It is the matter of the people of the nation. And democracy comes for the people, of the people, and by the people. So that is what we follow, sir. Now, the, 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 no, 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 sir, no, sir, no, sir. That's what I said to you. You look at me every time, sir. You look at me every time, sir. You look at me every time, sir. You don't be afraid of, oh, you, you my Tobu. You're from Nandroga, I'm from Ra. Sir? So, you know, you, you, every time you look at me when you talk, sir. Yeah? And, the, and, the, and the fourth is our sugar industry. Sir, the government came over very hard. And I, 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 at this venture, I, I need to tell you, sir, the, the Permanent Secretary for Sugar is a very humble man. He's a very humble man. Uh, Yugesh Karan, he does his job. But my request over here, sir, the sugar industry, the, the government pulled in millions of dollars in there. In 1999, our, our tonnage was 4 million tons of cane. But government did its share. I'm not going to criticize anybody in here, sir, but it's a point. Now we have got only 1.4 million tons of cane in this country. Why? Our sugar mill is closed here. We should have them on sugar mill over here. But it is, it is both ways for us to plant cane and for the government to build up the mill here. So this is one of the requests that I'm making. And also, at this juncture, I need to thank the, the CEO of the FCCC for his great and marvelous job that he did done on the transportation and all those things and the diesel rebates been given to us. So this is some of the requests that I'm making to you in this budget. I'm not here to criticize anybody. I'm not here to, to say negative about anything. But what is actually is killing our lives day to day, that is the issue that I'm going to bring it to you, Honorable Minister. And also the grants, 
the, the, the grant that was being given to the machines. If you form a cooperative, then you get a 90,000 grant. If you see the private sectors that brought up the machines, and I declare my interest over here, sir. I brought up two machines, the third one is coming over. <coughs> and if you see the figures in Rekereke, we are the hardest, the highest ones that the tasks that came from here to, to Bamin. So the grants would not only be given to the cooperative, to the individuals who can bring up and support the sugar industry in the country. And that is why I said I declare my interest, sir. But I'm not crazy to get that $90,000. You know, say, how hard a man I am at the grassroots level. But this is just a request to everybody. When it's a democratic country, it must be for everybody, sir. Thank you, sir. And also, the last would be the, um, the interest rates, the wages. The wages and salaries. As you have already mentioned on the, on the government, I know it uh, observes the, the major income of the government. It observes the ma major income of the, of the government, of the budget. And I also request uh, that uh, uh, the province of Raj should not be forgotten. There are many others who need to talk to you on these issues, sir, uh, that we need. It, it's, 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 it's the free life. Uh, we also want to enjoy that life that has been enjoyed in Suva or in Nandroga, for instance, sir. And uh, for information, uh, sir, uh, as, as Tobus, uh, we know that a uh, that, uh, uh, lot, of, lot of young the, the kids have been produced in Nandroga mostly when we take a survey so throughout, the, throughout the country. So, sir, thank you very, very much indeed for coming to Ra. And if that can be noted and put into your budget this year, but I know we are going through a hard life. I'm not going to pressure you too much, but this is the request that we have made. And I also say, the last would be, if the monitoring process on the Ministry for Works and Energy would be done. The, the FRA is, is the body of the government that looks after the, the roads, the wharfs, and everyone in Fiji. But you know, the the money that has been put into this, uh, these sections is too much. Sir. And the last is the Ministry for Health, which I need to talk, sir. If you visit the Rekereke Hospital now, from here, strictly go to Rekereke Hospital and go to the toilets and the bathroom of Rekereke, then you're going to know what is, what is our Rekereke Hospital, sir. And, uh, you know, take, a, take a few minutes of time, sir, to visit these areas. And you see that, you know, Government is putting their, their funds in there, but you know, you see the, the, the condition of our Rekereke Hospital, uh, you will come to know about it. And I request you to go and visit in a few minutes there. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, you know, like, like I said, it's not about freedom or democracy and all that stuff that you're talking about, this is about the budget. So let's not get straight away and get carried away with the political angle. Now, let me talk about FDB. FDB, as you know, is a development bank. It's, it's not, we can't say it's our bank, it's a development bank. Most of the loans that FDB does give, as you know, is unsecured loan. You know that. No commercial bank will ever give you a loan without security. You also know that too. Banks, commerc commercial, commercial banks, Commercial banks don't give you money without security, unless you're going to borrow $1,500 and you're working somewhere. That's a fact. You know that. Let's not mislead people. FDB, 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 FDB also gives secured loan and unsecured loan. I was in Loma Ivuna about four weeks ago, where the ginger farmers can access up to $50,000 not because they've taken a mortgage on the land, but they have actually got an arrangement with the people who buy the ginger from the farmers. So if, for example, I'm a ginger farmer and I sell $20,000 worth of ginger, the payment will go to FDB first. FDB will take out the deduction, then the farmer gets the money. You know that. That's how FDB works. You also know that FDB is not like commercial banks where they accept deposits FDB is also has got a mandate in respect of the focus of the bank. It's a development bank. 
its focus should not be on commercial enterprises. What it does is that it lends to commercial enterprises to cross-subsidize. You should know this. So if they lend to a commercial entity at 12 or 13 percent, they can lend at a cheaper rate to the farmers and lower in income people. Many of the uh, loans that FDB funds, government actually subsidizes those interest rates. How does FDB get its money? FDB goes out to the market. FDB does not get a grant from government. FDB gets a guarantee from government to go out to the market, raise money from the market, then they use that money to then on lend to people. You know this. That's what, how FDB operates. We have also seen in the past where FDB has been used as a piggy bank for people. In the 90s, people who went and bought Class A shares in FDB, the rich people, if they bought Class A shares in Fijian Holdings, they got a loan from FDB. And guess what? The loan was written off subsequently. You know this. We also know that after 87, all the supermarkets, M call or whatever it is called, was set up, given to people who could not run businesses, and all that money went under the table. Not on the table, but it finished. That's the history of FDB. Today, as you also know this, FDB is now disbursing loans also digitally. Farmers can also apply on their phones. They can get money disbursed on their phones. 90% of the applications in this concessional loan financing was done, was done digitally. Now, it's okay to stand up here and make a populist statement, but it is highly irresponsible of you to do that when you know that the facts are not correct. Number two, in respect of the crown leases, there has been a review. For many crown leases, for a number of years, the rent was not even reviewed. You know there's a review clause. Everybody knows. But you've just speculated. You said, oh, five years' time will be this month. Five years' time will be this month. How do you know that? No, no, no. Okay, it has gone up. We also announced in the budget that anybody that faces hardship, we will pay their lease in that revised budget for Itauke land and also Crown land. We made an announcement. There's a budgetary allocation made for this. Read the book. It's there. It's in here. We've already had people who've applied. If a cane farmer cannot do repayment, you can actually apply and we'll do the repayment for you, for the lease monies. It's there. So please, don't make this populist statement when you know there's a provisioning for it. And also, it does not make sense for any lessor to increase the rent knowing full well that the lessee cannot in future years be able to afford it if the output of that particular land is going to be far less than what is required. And that's the fact. There's an allocation. Please read the budget. That's why I keep on saying, go to the Ministry of Economy website. If you don't want to read the budget papers, for someone like you who makes a lot of statements, read that. It's available. People have already applied for it. Any farmer, any person facing hardship on Itauke land or gov state land that's leasing the land can apply. We already had applications for that. Number two. Number three, the other issue you raised about, uh, about agriculture. Now, you see, the, the point is I was in uh, Kuku in Nasori on Saturday night. And there was somebody who raised this issue about cassava. They said that, you know, uh, when I go to Nasori market now, I don't get the same price. Because there's too many people growing cassava. So the, the price I used to get for a bag of cassava, I don't get it anymore. I had a week before that somebody saying to me, I've also got cassava. He said, I want AMA to buy it. So I asked him the question, I said, what will AMA do with it? He said, I don't care, throw it in the river, but just give me the money. You see, so when we do farming, as you know, it's a supply-demand issue. There is somebody at the moment in uh, Lotoka who we understand is setting up a flour mill for cassava, to make flour out of cassava. So, you know, we, we're hoping, I understand Mr. Agriculture is working with them, because then you have a, you know, you have a value adding to the cassava. At the moment, cassava is dealt in a very basic manner. There's some cassava chips being made by uh, flour mills of Fiji, but the other cassava we just simply sell by the roadside. People boil it, etc. So we need to do the value adding, and I agree about the value adding. We have to do that. In the same, I mean, the turmeric market, I don't know where you got the $2 billion figure from, 
but obviously there's a growing demand for turmeric. As you know also, a lot of the turmeric that is actually being harvested is in the wild. In Navosa, there were a lot of wild turmeric. So you have villagers going out on the hillsides, they're digging up the turmeric and they're selling it. We also have to make sure that the pricing is right for the people who go and dig in the hills. If somebody's going to go to that hill and come to you and you buy it off them for $1.10 a kilo, but then you sell it for $3 a kilo. It's not going to be a viable proposition for them. And that was expect one of the complaints about those people in Navosa. They were saying we spend all day with the family and everybody going out in top of the hills and the, the middleman who's buying the turmeric from us is paying us very little money. So we need to do some regulation about it. In the same way that the Honorable Prime Minister announced about the opening of the beach dimmer. Right? The beach dimmer, we have to make sure that they are credible people who actually buy it off them and give them the right price. Otherwise, these villagers will be going out, spending all day getting the beach dimmer, and the price they get will be very little. So we want them to get the right price too. Markets, yes, to find markets uh, is not necessarily very easy. Branding, obviously, is very important. And now, you know, for example, even if you want to go into organic farming, to get actual certification, we don't have anybody in Fiji that actually can certify to meet international standards. So we either have to send people overseas and bring them back, or we get people from overseas to do the certification. In respect of the, of the roads, yes, roads gets about $300 million a year in budget allocation. You know, last week I was in Tawake, in the Tikina of Tawake in Vanualevu. We've just cut a road to the Tikina of Tawake. The entire eastern seaboard of the Vanualevu, all the way up to Undu Point, there's a number of villages there. They don't even have a road. They don't have a road. And to be honest with you, I was sitting there in Tawake village after this new road that was cut and I was sitting there in the village and thinking to myself, what were the previous governments doing? Even if they cut 50 to 70 kilometers of new roads, all of these places will be connected. They catch fish up in Undu Point, they got no connection, they have to come by boat, then they have to catch some carrier. By the time they end up in Lambasa, they've already spent five or seven hundred dollars and the fish price goes up or they're able to go in a loss. Road connectivity is very important. In the same way what you said about uh, wastage is also very important to uh, take cognizance of. But to have a political agenda to say reduce the budget for FRA is very silly. Because we need to ensure that people get connected. We have people in Nanronga, in Navosa, in Valley Road, where it was called the salad bowl of Fiji. Not no, no. No, you did say, you said they're getting too much. You said, hey, they're recording it. You said too much. You said too much. You said too much. Anyway, I, I don't lie. So, Valley Road, all of those places have now, in the west bank of Valley Road is tar sealed. Now, why is it tar sealed? Because when you have tomatoes being produced, and they come on gravel road, bumping all the way to Singatoga Market or to the hotels, 30% of your fruit gets damaged. The shelf life is lost, less. So we need to take the strategic investments to be able to invest in roading, to improve the quality. Of course, if you said in that particular place that happened, doesn't mean hundreds of millions of dollars or millions of dollars got wasted. You don't know that. It could have been $400,000. You don't know it's millions of dollars. You did not go into the study of it. You don't know. You have not seen the books. You don't even know whether if they did a bad job, whether they asked to redo it at their own cost. You don't know that. So you should not make statements that are all encompassing without getting the facts right. You know, you, I, I'm saying about that one particular road, you said they lost millions of dollars. But how do you know that? Okay, anyway, I've now moved along the allocation of the budget. I'm talking about the particular road, you said they lost millions of dollars. My point is that you don't know, you have not seen the books. I, and I said to you that I agree with you that if there's wasted, we need to address it. And I don't know how long ago that was. When was it? Okay. So that's good. So you raise that, the staff are there, we'll find out. And we'll get back to you. Next time I drive past your house, I'll give you a phone call and give you the information. Okay. So my, my point is, I mean, those issues about hospi hospitals, I agree that we need to improve. We need to improve the quality of the services. We need to improve the infrastructure. And we'll continue to do that. 
lot of the times we are dealing with infrastructure that is very old. You know, as you know, before, a lot of the health centers and the hospitals were built by the, what we used to be called PWD. PWD used to do that. And even if you go to certain hospitals where there's a sink in a hospital, right? There's a sink or bathroom. The edging on the bench was made out of wood. They did not use their brains. You do not put wood around a place that's going to get wet all the time. Obviously, the paint will come off. Obviously, it starts rotting. You need to put stainless steel. So people in those days used to do construction just for the that one year or two years without thinking long term. The steel sink may have cost you a bit more money, but it will last you longer. So that's how we need to do things. That's how we need to do construction. If you, go, if you look at the new constructions we've done, a completely different space altogether. Next question, please, or comment. Uh, uh, this could be some input or uh, first I just want to, to thank and appreciation for the presentation today. Thank you so much. Uh, I will talk a little bit in regards to subsidy. I, I appreciate for that. In regards to this uh, inorganic fertilizer. And uh, I like that for $25 for the government to pay, it's give me relief. And all my dear farmers who are here. Uh, in, in the other one, our uh, chemicals and all, I think uh, there should be a subsidy also before. And that can be put because we are facing in uh, doing cleaning up our farms and all. Uh, I just want to... Uh, to elaborate more on uh, these three sectors, the uh, forest, Ministry of Forest, uh, the agriculture, and the sugar industry. For the organic, I, I heard a little bit from you, if that c can be taken in consideration in regarding to uh, organic uh, farming. Uh, we can come up with uh, the forestry, with the green and branches, this can be uh, done in a large scale, and even uh, the uh, fish waste in Levuka, this, uh, this is done in Japan, I believe, and we can cut costs even the economic, uh, economy for importing all these uh, organic... Uh, George, George let's, let's respect him, he's speaking. Let's, uh, they listen to you quietly when you were speaking. Please, let's give them the same respect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, our listeners and uh, minister, honorable minister. In this uh, regards, uh, the inorganic fertilizer, which uh, pollute our land. And I'll talk into this uh, point, the land, that uh, if we can focus on the land, and our bill, land bills can be explained uh, thoroughly and to, to all the people because there is uh, more uh, information coming out to post in all the m m minds of the people in regards to land bills and all. For me, I was created from that dust and I have to get that dust for the priority of my life and everyone who owns the land. Even in the lands department or the Tauke land, we have to till the land for the betterment of our economy and the nation as a whole. Even root crops or the cane. I'm, I'm, I'm a cane farmer and I'm sorry, I, I want to talk to you alone somewhere because I'm sending you some emails in regards to fair trade. I'm, I'm standing tall for the farmers for the benefit of the new generation and because some we are just uh, nanu manikua matinikua so uh, i'm doing that for the people i even uh, it was raised from uh, saka in in regards to um the we can not go up to four million as before the tonnage and the quantity of the tin and uh, i have been doing this from 10 years when i left the government to the people there for dialogue to 
kill the land. And that is what we should do to educate the landowners. Because some of them, they don't want to give their land because of the tradition from before. And I'm doing that to go to the landowners to educate them to give their land for the future generation, new generation, new guns, to utilize the land so we can increase the cane production. It's easy. It's, it's a matter of dialogue. And the Living God program is dialogue. You dialogue, you will get the point. You, we, we don't have to, to point fingers to others and in those kinds of things. We have to work together in regards to that economy. Just the economy, I, I used to say that it is like a birthday cake, a piece to everyone. So thank you very much for, I've been going around to the villages of Ra, saying the, uh, saying the same words you say, we, we are lining up for that piece of cake. Thank you for that piece of cake. And we are looking forward that you'll be giving that piece of cake again to us. I, I don't get that cake, but I like the way. That's the piece of cake. It's a, a, it's a birthday cake. It's three, four stories. Keep it like that. We enjoy that. So uh, for the people who are here, if you got the land, please peel the land. For me, my land, you, go, you don't have any six inches. I plant it for the betterment of this nation and that economy and that birthday cake. cake. We can work together to build that, the topping for the better decade. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, I think I also wanted to make a point. I think it relates also to what George had said earlier on. You know, in, in Fiji, for since the colonial times, if you leased Itauke land or if you leased crown land or government land, state land, for tourism, residential, commercial, industrial, you'd get, you can get 99-year leases. But for agriculture, it was only 30 years. Only 30 years. That's why you never had commercial banks lending in the agriculture sector. Very few. We used to have a National Bank of Fiji, which we of course lost after 1987. They used to give crop liens. You would know that, they had crop liens. I know this because when I work for Colonial, those crop liens had passed on to Colonial. So that's why we don't have large-scale mechanization in the agriculture sector. Because, you see, to, to have large tractors, uh, you know, mechanization, you need long-term leases so people access to funds. Then people would invest. So if you go to ANZ and Westpac, other banks, they're lending to the tourism sector in the Itokia land or government land for 99-year leases. Other banks are lending because it's a 99-year lease. The law we changed some years back now, that now agricultural land can also be given out for 99 years. So in that way, you can get more investment, you know, to have mechanization. As George also highlighted, that only we recently started this uh, cane harvesting, you know, the harvesters that come along. Now, the reason why we said, and I forgot to mention this actually, the reason why we said the, about the cooperatives is because most cane farmers on their own can't afford a harvester. Right? On their own, they can't. So you form a cooperative. We give you one third. The other two thirds, you get a loan from FDB. And then you can charge for it too. People paid you at $17 something, and now it's gone up to $21, $23. $20, $20, $20, $20.60. Because of the fuel increase. So and he was saying, for example, he wants it on his, uh, he wants the, he wants a grant on his own for his business, you know, him, for himself. You see, it's not about people being treated unequally. In the same way, the 360 was not given to him because he's got money. 360 was given to people who did not have a job. In the same way, you can afford to buy a cane harvest on your own. The individual farmer can't afford to buy the cane harvest on their own because they're not that wealthy. So it's not about equality, it's about making sure we have targeted assistance. Right? So we don't say to people who sell, people sell vegetables in the market, they don't pay market fees. We don't say to the people who sell vegetables in the supermarket, we'll give you subsidy. No, they can afford it. In the same way we give social welfare payment to people who cannot afford it. People who can afford it, they don't get social welfare. 
So the, the, that's been the issue. You know, sugarcane production in Vanuolevu went down by 50% in the 90s and early 2000s. Why? Because the leases weren't renewed. So most of the Lambasa people are now living between Suva and Osori Corridor as taxi drivers or whatever. They live as squatters. Some of them have their homes near a sewage pipe. No land. Huge pressure. There's lots of land available. It would have been a different story if the leases weren't renewed and they'd used the land. But they're not using the land. It's lying idle. So they're not getting any money from lease payments. The land is lying idle. The shops have closed down. The school numbers have dropped. The buses hardly run. So it, de it diminishes the economic cap capacity of the place. So, and you're absolutely right. People need to link that to the economy. So, as far as the Tokyo land is concerned, it's protected in the constitution. You can't convert it to any other land. No way, right? You got it all tied in. So, you can make money from leasing the land if you don't want to use it yourself. You know it's protected. In the same way, we've got an Itoke uh, land development fund where if uh, landowners come and say, look, we want to subdivide that land over there, we want to build, you know, 25 lots. Government will come and subdivide it for them. We'll build the road, we put the footpath, we connect it to water, we connect electricity. Because we want you to not only be what we call asset rich, but also cash rich. So when you subdivide the land, you get the money, you don't pay anything for, uh, you know, development costs. Somebody over here may want to lease the land to build their house. When somebody leases the land to build their house, they get a 99-year lease, they can go to the bank and say, hey, I've got a 99-year lease. I want to borrow some money and build a nice concrete home. And when they build homes, it creates economic activity.